My friends, something crazy is happening right now in France. In what is a shocking, but perhaps also maybe not so surprising twist, France actually appears to be turning right wing. This past Sunday, France would vote in its first rounds of National Assembly elections, which were called by President Emmanuel Macron earlier in the month of June, three years before they were actually scheduled. The result of this surprise snap election was that the right-wing National Rally, the party of former presidential candidate Marine Le Pen, ended up scoring approximately 34% of the vote, followed by an alliance of left-wing parties, which had around 28% of the vote, and Macron, the president, the guy who is in charge, his centrist coalition ended up placing in third place with 21% of the vote. My cat just jumped up here. She was way too surprised by the results as well. The specific seat-by-seat -seat results are not yet known, but the right appears to be on the verge of either a legislative majority, which would mean that the national rally would likely get to choose the next prime minister, or we're going to end up seeing a hung parliament in which the right-wing elements end up controlling most of the seats. But we will not truly know until the second and final round of the election, consisting of runoffs in the individual constituencies, take place on July 7th. For those of you who are watching right now and follow anything when it comes to international politics, this is massive and the entire thing has come as quite a shock. Macron's decision to call the vote, which was the first snap election since 1997, this came immediately after right-wing parties ended up exceeding expectations in European parliamentary elections. This is something that was intended to blunt the right-wing's rise, and Macron has deemed them to be a threat to the future of France, as he would say. When all this went down in early June, President Macron would dissolve the lower house of France's parliament in a surprise announcement that would send voters back to the polls after his party was handed a very humbling defeat defeat by right-wing elements in the European elections in early June. Marine Le Pen's more anti-immigration nationalist party was estimated to get around 31 to 32 percent of the vote, which is a historic result that is more than double the share of Macron's Renaissance party, which was projected to reach only around 15 percent. Now, before we get further into this, I really should mention that this that we are talking about is not necessarily an isolated event. Right-wing elements have been on the rise in Europe for years now, with this past year perhaps seeing the greatest gains in decades. This, in turn, is changing the geopolitical landscape of Europe as we know it, and really, who can tell what is going to be happening here in the future? Now, when we talk about this, Macron himself was not, of course, a candidate in the EU elections, and his term as president is still technically going to run for three more years. In the latest legislative elections that would occur in 2022, Macron's centrist party would win the most seats, but at the time that this happened, it actually had still lost seats from what it previously had. It would lose its majority at the National Assembly, which in in turn forced lawmakers into political maneuvering in order to actually pass bills and do anything. But with this previous decision that he made, he was taking a big risk with a move that could very easily backfire and increase the chances of Le Pen to eventually take power, which things seem to be on track to actually do. What we're talking about here is a scenario in which the opposition party would eventually win a parliamentary majority, which in turn could lead to fraught power sharing situations called cohabitation something in which Macron has to name a prime minister who has different views from himself, which we're going to be explaining that whole thing with France here in a bit. As Le Pen would say about the matter, quote, we're ready for it. We're ready to exercise power if the French people place their trust in us in these future legislative elections. We're ready to turn the country around, ready to defend the interests of the French, ready to put an end to mass immigration, and ready to make the purchasing power of the French a priority. The EU election results were most certainly a hard blow for Macron, who has been advocating for European-wide efforts to defend Ukraine, and also the need for the EU to boost its own defenses and industry. The national rallies lead candidate for the EU elections, Jordan Bardella, would campaign for limiting free movements of migrants by carrying out national border controls, as well as dialing back EU climate rules. Now, this is quite serious, but what's interesting to note is that the party no longer wants to leave the EU and the euro behind, but instead what it wants to do is weaken it from within and reform it. As Bardella would say about the matter, quote, tonight our compatriots have expressed a desire for change. Emmanuel Macron is tonight a weakened president. Interestingly enough, though, before we move on, EU election projections would show a resurgence of the Socialist Party, which would get about 14% of the votes. This party did the exact opposite and campaigned on more ambitious climate policies as well as protection for European businesses and workers. Reacting to Macron's announcement, far-left politician Francois Ruffin would call on leaders from the left, including the Greens, to unite under a single, quote, popular front, 
banner. Something that was designed to avoid the worst to win. Everything that I've described so far, all of this is what was taking down at the EU elections in preparation for what just happened here on June 30th. And that being said, what it is that they feared did happen, and it is projected to continue. Because what would happen is that National Rally would win around 33.2% of the vote, according to results published Monday by France's Interior Ministry. A coalition of center-left, Greens, and far-left parties, known as the New Popular Front, would come in second, with 27.9%, while French President Emmanuel Macron's alliance of political centrists, called the Ensemble, would come in third at only 20.7%. All three groups that we're talking about here are set to take part in a critical second round that will occur on July 7th. And this, mind you, is a month before the Olympic Games are set to start in France when all of these changes are occurring domestically. That, in turn, brings us to the important question that we have for this video, which is, why is the far right gaining popularity in France? And what will this mean for the future? For anyone who is watching this right now and planning on putting something in the comment section, please keep in mind that this is not a political pundit page. I am not going to be telling you how it is that you should vote on a matter, or how it is that you should think. The only thing that I'm going to be doing right now is I'm going to be explaining why it is that we got to where we are today. And so with that, let's go ahead and dive in. The appeal of far-right ideas and voices that promise lower immigration, increased security, common-sense economic measures that favor the lower middle classes, and political pushback on EU regulations that affect everything from farm practices to human rights, all of these things have been ideas that have been steadily growing in France for decades. And on that note, Europe as well. As I said, France is not alone in this. Political populists on the right and left are everywhere these days, and across Europe we are seeing more of a resurgence in right-wing ideas. But when we talk about the French context, Macron is facing opposition from a number of different issues, hot-button topics such as changes in retirement, unemployment issues, and immigration. And what has sucked for him is that on almost every single issue, he has been stuck in what is effectively a lose-lose situation. The classic example that we can bring up for the purpose of this video is the relationship that exists between retirement age and immigration. Now, for anyone watching this, it might sound odd, but allow me to explain, because this is crucial not only to talk about France, but I know that in future videos talking about issues that other countries are facing, this is also going to come up. For context, this past year, President Emmanuel Macron would force through a controversial plan to raise the retirement age in France from 62 years old to 64. He is doing this in a nation that for the longest amount of time has been famous for its view of work-life balance and specifically in supporting the worker. There are, after all, those fabled 35-hour work weeks, the long lunches, and even longer vacations. I'm sure that a number of people who are watching this right now have probably seen TikToks and shorts and other things that specifically compare work-life balance in the United States versus France. A change in this status quo would effectively result in a revolt of the French people against their own government and system. And when I say revolt, I mean there are a few people in history that can revolt quite like the French. Protesters angry about the legislation would go and set fire to cars. They would clash with police. They would let thousands of tons of rotting garbage pile up in the streets. And these protesters were composed of a variety of different peoples. French workers, activists, students, political opposition parties, all of these different groups would take part in nationwide strikes and demonstrations over changes to the country's retirement system. A number of you watching this may be a little bit confused right now as to why this would be the case. To explain that, I'm going to need to kind of explain how France and the United States stack up when it comes to retirement so you can understand the difference here. Retirement in the United States is largely up to the individual and the circumstances in which they find themselves. In the US, retirement income can come from a combination of social security benefits, company-sponsored programs such as a 401k, an individual retirement account or IRA, profit-sharing schemes, or some other type of private tax-advantageous retirement savings plan. Social security benefits are based on earnings history and dependent on the age in which the benefits start and index to inflation. Pension plans such as 401ks and IRAs, these things are entirely voluntary. Employee contributions to those plans can be matched by an employer, but they aren't always. That's entirely dependent upon the individual company. The average Social Security retirement benefit in 2023 is estimated to be around $1,827 per month, this being according to AARP. 
an independent nonprofit organization that focuses on issues affecting older Americans. In comparison to the United States, France retirement system is something that is made up of three basic parts. You have a state pension, a mandatory supplementary pension program for private industry workers, and a separate voluntary private pension plan. Now, the value of the state pension is calculated using variables such as the average yearly earnings and a total period of contributions. Employees and employers both contribute to the compulsory supplementary plan on a pay-as-you-go basis, and besides that, voluntary private pensions represent a relatively small part of the French retirement market. The average monthly state pension payment in France is around $1,327, this being according to France's Center of European for International Liaisons for Social Security, or CLIS. When I talk about this, that figure does not include payments from the required supplementary program or other private plans. And French workers, on average, when talking about the amounts that they put in based on their earnings, they will typically earn around $43,000 per year, compared to the average $60,000 for someone in the United States. At least when I talk about that, that is considering figures from 2021. Obviously, things have changed a little bit since then, but there is obviously a difference in which someone from the United States typically makes more. Moving on from this, though, access to Social Security retirement benefits in the United States can take place from the time that someone is 67 years old. Early retirement is available for Americans who are 62 years or older with reduced Social Security benefits but you're not going to get your full benefits unless you wait to retire at the age of 67. In comparison, in France, the retirement age for the longest time for the state pension was 62 for those who were born in or after the year 1955. From September of this previous year, this would raise to 64 for those who were born in or after 1968. Early retirement would still be available for people who were 58 years old, but that is only if certain criteria were met. When we talk about this age difference, that is pretty massive. France's age is quite early in comparison to most Western countries, and the financial drain that that has on their country cannot be understated, as people on average nowadays live significantly longer than they did several decades ago. Of course, when we talk about this, it would not be nearly as much of a problem if there were more people who were working every single year as a population grows, but that's not exactly what is happening, and that is where immigration comes into play, the second factor of this equation. Now, before recent years, this is not something that necessarily had to factor in for France, because among developed countries, France has for a long time been an exception when it comes to birth rates. It is something that in comparison to all the other nations, as such for anyone who has seen my video that I did on South Korea, it hasn't fallen into that same kind of trap, or at least not to the same kind of degree, until recently. The demographic report for 2023 published on January 16th by the National Statistics Institute, or INSEE, shows that the country is coming back into line with the general trend that you see around the world. For the first time since the end of the Second World War, fewer than 700,000 births were recorded, which is down 20% of what it was in 2010. The number of newborns per 1,000 inhabitants was halved in comparison to what it was in 1950, and the fertility rate would fall to 1.68 children per woman of childbearing age, moving further and further away from what you need for generational renewal, which is 2.1. That is actually a very recent trend. France, for the longest time, has been beating out other European nations by a margin of like 10 to 30% in regards to births. That is not the case anymore. Now, we won't necessarily get into why that is the case. That could easily be a whole other video in and of itself. But the decline in the fertility rate year after year in France is accelerating the aging of the country. The decrease in births combined with the rising life expectancy, all of this represents a huge challenge for the financing of its extensive social welfare system. Less workers means less people paying into the system with taxes, which means that an increasing number of elderly people are going to be an even greater drain upon society. That is why the retirement reform that I was talking about here before consists first and foremost of plugging the yearly deficit between pension contributions and pension spending. After posting a surplus in 2021 and 2022, the pension system would fall into a deficit from 2023 onwards. That deficit is projected to reach 13.5 billion euros by 2030, according to COR 
the French public body who is in charge of monitoring the pension system. As such, between 2023 and 2030, the cumulative pension deficit that we're talking about here could reach a negative 60 to 80 billion euro drain. Thus, you can see as to why that would be unsustainable and why in the short term, Macron has tried to temporarily fix the issue by raising the retirement age in order to offset the damage. But that offset of damage was done at the cost of damaging his own waning popularity. The solution to below replacement level fertility is traditionally immigration, but that in turn has been one of the biggest issues plaguing Europe for the past decade, as mass immigration from Africa and the Middle East have flooded European nations and bring with them young hands that, while they can perform labor and fulfill tax quotas, also simultaneously bring crime, social strife, and further drains on suffering European welfare models. More than 385,000 such migrants would enter Europe in 2023, which was nearly triple the pandemic era low in 2020. These were just a fraction of the 29 million immigrants who arrived in the past decade, many of them legally, but also many of them illegally, placing significant strain on a migration system that has for years been considered ineffectual. Honestly, when I'm talking about this, the migration crisis could very easily be its own video entirely, but we are going to need to go into some details here. The migrants that we're speaking about in order to get to Europe would endure voyages of unseaworthy vessels. They would travel on foot through war zones or scalding deserts. They would have to deal with predatory human smugglers and hostile locals. The risks for these people to get to Europe was immense. And last year alone, more than 3,000 migrants ended up dying crossing the Mediterranean Sea in order to try and reach Europe for a better life. These recent migration surges have oftentimes been driven by disruptions caused by serious conflict. In 2015, as an example, the main cause was fighting and persecution in Afghanistan and Syria. More recently, Russia's war in Ukraine has fueled a surge in immigration to Europe, including from African and Middle Eastern countries, that even though this is not in the region that Russia and Ukraine are, these would still be from places that largely relied on trade with Ukraine or Russia or others, who in turn have been disrupted. I mean, when we talk about this, migration experts say that a global rise in conflict over the past decade has caused the number of displaced people across the world to almost double, reaching 114 million people in 2023. Other factors that also contribute to this are the COVID-19 pandemic and its economic fallout, a string of coups that would occur in Africa in the Sahel region, humanitarian crises in countries such as Afghanistan, as well as natural disasters that are only exacerbated by climate change. But arguably more crucial for states such as France, Europe is a magnet for migrants who are seeking better economic opportunities. And oftentimes when these people come, they are landless young men. These individuals are oftentimes a source of friction with locals for whom they compete with for jobs, particularly as the EU weathers its own economic downturn with record inflation and more than 27 million people underemployed or unemployed this past spring. Combine those details with the public perception of crime statistics, and you have a recipe for more nationalistic sentiment to build. You can probably see from what I've explained so far why it is that I had to mention both retirement age and also this issue with immigration. The aging population of France needs immigrant workers, but at the same time, those workers bring with them a whole host of other problems that have to be dealt with. This is affecting more and more things as the total per percentage of immigrants within the nation continues to rise. The country's National Institute of Statistics and Economic Studies, or INSEE, would find in a study released last July that France's share of immigrant population had risen from 8.5% in 2010 to 10.3% in 2022. And that number is set to continue to grow. France, in turn, is home to one of the largest Muslim populations in Western Europe, and it has long experienced very heated debates about the role of religion and ethnicity in its society, something that is only fueled by waves of crime that grab headlines. As an example of what it is that I mean, in the year 2020, there was a 20-year-old man who was badly beaten on the streets in France. Now, while this is not a good thing, it is not necessarily something that would grab national headlines until you look at the details of this particular kind of case. The man who was beaten was the Muslim son of a police officer, and he was beaten by a gang of five men who were also Muslims. 
This particular victim had been enjoying Christmas lunch with his family when he was attacked. And following the arrest of the gang, the leader of this gang would tell police officers in an attempt to justify the beating that, quote, it's not Muslim to celebrate Christmas. That right there is the reason why I bring up this particular story. Because what has been happening in France and other regions in Europe is that you have seen an increase in justifications for violence based off religious beliefs. This type of violence from first or second generation immigrants has become all too common across Europe, as large numbers do not integrate into the societies in which they live. When we speak about these nations, of all of the countries in Europe, France is arguably under one of the greatest amounts of pressure from radical militants, having experienced a series of Islamist terror attacks in recent years, where three people, as an example, died in the southern French city of Nice following a knife attack at a church. One of the elderly victims in this case was practically beheaded. The suspect, who repeatedly had shouted, God is greatest, in Arabic during the attack, was a 21-year-old Tunisian national who had recently arrived as an asylum seeker. Only a few weeks earlier, seven Muslim suspects, two of which had been just 14 and 15 years old, were charged for the beheading of their school teacher, a person by the name of Samuel Patty. The reason as to why they had done this is because he had shown his pupils controversial cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad, something that was not allowed in their view, and this murder would subsequently shock the French nation. The things that I have just described here are only some of the examples of atrocities that have been carried out by Islamist extremists in France in recent years, things which have deeply unsettled the population, many of which were still recovering from the horrible events of 2015, when in January, two Islamist militant gunmen would force their way into the office offices of the satirical magazine Charlie Hedbo and would shoot dead 12 people. Later that same year, gunmen and suicide bombers would launch multiple attacks on the Bataclan concert hall and adjacent restaurants and bars, which in turn would leave 130 people dead and hundreds of people wounded. Six months prior to that, a gunman would go and drive a vehicle into a crowd who was celebrating Bastille Day in Nice, which would kill 86 people. These events are obviously horrible, and by contrast to it, when we talk about the severe beating of a 20-year-old that doesn't really seem like it would factor in all that much. But for politicians, it really does. And the French interior minister, Gerald Darmanin, would claim that the beating was a, quote, example of fundamentalist separation, which erodes traditional French values. When we talk about this, in any country which is on high alert for any Muslim extremist activity, any such incident is going to receive national and international attention. Terrorism in the name of Islam has claimed hundreds of lives across Europe over the past two decades, which many claim would be linked with mass migration from the Islamic world. That, in turn, has been shaking the politics of the continent, and nowadays, Islam and migration are highly debated hot issues for many European countries. For those who are wondering how it is that these things are connected, because there isn't necessarily a direct connection with migration and religion, according to Pew researchers, 86% of the refugees that have arrived in Europe are Muslim. Considering the different cultural and religious values of the varying peoples that have arrived, as well as the tendencies to reside in enclaves, this has, over the years, led to only further strains within French society and affected group perceptions. And so it is then, from everything that I have talked about, that arguably one of the biggest and most recent factors to shift public perception on this particular issue were the riots that would occur in 2023 after the death of a young Tunisian man by police. And when I explain this, it's going to require a little bit of context. On June 27th, 2023, two Parisian police prefecture officers would spot a car that was speeding along a bus lane. The officers would stop the car, and the driver, Nahil Mazouk, would then attempt to try and drive away, and an officer would fire at him. The two passengers that were in the vehicle would flee, and Mazouk would ultimately be pronounced dead at 9.15 a.m., having been killed by the police. As for why things escalated so quickly and drastically, this is something that I, I really do need to explain. It is due to an ease in previous restrictions. After police strikes following the burning of two police officers on the 8th of October in 2016 in viry Châtillon, the law that limited police use of firearms strictly to cases of self-defense, just like any other citizen, this was revised in 2017 concerning refusals to submit to traffic stops. The revised law would permit police to shoot at vehicles that were fleeing in a traffic stop if the vehicle was putting the passengers or passerbys in danger. This was seen as necessary by French authorities, who would say that the police were increasingly being attacked by, and I quote, jihadists, mobsters, and hooded youths. 
In the case that I just mentioned, a large group of youths had swarmed around a police car and used Molotov cocktails against two police officers. A 28-year-old policeman would suffer life-threatening burns and was then placed in a medically induced coma. A female officer who was also in the car was badly burned as well on the hands and face. The officers at the time were guarding surveillance video cameras in an area that was well known in France for widespread drug dealing, following several attempts to destroy the devices. Another two officers who were sent in as backup would then also sustain injuries. So for anyone who is watching this right now, you can probably imagine what kind of headlines this would create when literal gangs of youths are going around and throwing Molotov cocktails on police cars that are there to try and monitor drug dealing. This is something that can very severely warp perception. But anyway, back to Merzouk. When all of this went down, riots would very quickly follow. Riots were reported in the evening of the 27th of June after videos of his killing in Nanterre began to circulate. The unrest that would follow was largely concentrated in Nanterre, where rioters would throw projectiles at police, let off fireworks, and set cars, bus stops, trash cans, and even a school on fire. The rioting that we're talking about here would last all the way until morning in Nanterre, and from there would spread to other areas in the Ile de France and further. By the end of the day, there were at least 20 police officers who had been injured, 10 police cars that had been damaged, along with 31 people who had been arrested. In order to try and control the violence, over 2,000 police officers and gendarmes were deployed. On the very next day, on the 28th of June, riots were reported to grow to even more French cities. In Amiens, Dijon, Lyon, Lille, Clermont-Ferrand, and Strasbourg, more violence would take place. French media would report numerous incidents around Greater Paris region, which would involve fireworks and the launching of them at police. In Toulouse, arson and clashes between 100 demonstrators and police would result in 13 arrests as well as 20 vehicles being burned. During this time, there would be attacks reported on 27 national police stations, 4 gendarme barracks, 14 municipal police stations, including 10 by arson. Clashes between protesters and police, as well as the burning of vehicles, would continue in Nanterre during this time. Fires were set at more public buildings, construction companies, a school, a tram, and also looting would be widespread. Over the course of this time period, nationwide, at least 150 people were arrested during these events. 170 police officers were injured and 609 vehicles plus 109 buildings were damaged. And all of that is only taking place in the first couple days. Violence would continue for the next several days after this with details that after a time really start to become irrelevant as in the end I would just be repeating myself while simultaneously making a fool of myself for continuously trying to pronounce French names. But by the end of this, on the 4th of July, the president of one employee organization, the MEDEF, would estimate that the riots cost businesses around 1 billion euro during this time. This estimate was based on 200 businesses which had been thoroughly looted, 300 bank branches which had been destroyed, 220 supermarkets that were damaged, of which 25 had been burned to the ground, and nearly 1,200 independent businesses that were affected. Among all of these were 150 looted sportswear shops and 400 damaged French lottery outlets. As you can imagine from the events that I have described, for the people of France that bore witness to this and other events during this time period that I have listed, the images have largely stuck with them over the past year. All of what I have spoken about combined really answers the question of why is the right wing gaining popularity? Why is it gaining ground in France? The results of everything that I've spoken about so far have been reflected in the polls, but at this point we may actually see that the change that has been brought about is is not what was initially thought to happen. At the time that I'm making this video, it is a full five days after the initial point in which I put together the previous sections that you have seen, and as a result of the second round of elections in France happening literally a day and a half ago, I had to change how this video ended, and the results have been quite shocking. On Sunday, July 6th, France went to the polls for the second and final round of their legislative election, and despite the massive victory that they ended up having in the first round, not only did Marine Le Pen's national rally fail to win the good majority in the National Assembly as was expected, but because of a record number of tactical alliances that would occur between the center and left-wing candidates, the new left-wing popular front coalition actually came out on top. 
This, my friends, is massive, but in order to explain how exactly this happened, I need to explain a very key detail and part of French politics that I mentioned in here previously in the video. The reason that we are having a second round of elections is that the French National Assembly elections are held in two rounds in each constituency that no candidate wins a majority of the votes in that first round. Let me clarify that. In some constituencies, only a single election is going to happen, but that is in a place where there has been a clear majority for one party, so there is no need for another election. In many places, though, that does not happen, which will in turn force a second round. Now, obviously, you can't just have a repeat of the first round, which is going to result in basically the same kind of thing, so the rules change a bit for that second round. The change being that in addition to the top two candidates, only those that received at least 12.5% of the vote in the first round are eligible to run for the second. Meaning that if you had like 10 candidates run in the first, that is likely going to consolidate down to two or maybe three. The winner of the second round then takes the seat. Now, usually what ends up happening and has happened in the past is that only two candidates end up going through the second round in tightly contested areas. But another very possible but still rare situation is something known in France as a triangulaire, which as the name implies means you have three candidates, a triangle. And for those wondering when I say rare what exactly I mean, let me explain this. Back in the 2017 elections as an example, there was only a single triangulaire. That's it. And then when you go and look at the previous one in 2022, there was only eight of these, which is more than what was in 2017 as things became a little bit more contested by that point, but it was still not many. Especially when you consider the fact that France's National Assembly has 577 seats. But, and this is the big but, when we talk about this election in France, it could not be further than that. With a record high voter turnout in the modern day of 67%, which is quite rare when you look at modern democracies, the vote was simultaneously not only larger than expected, but actually evenly split between the three parties in the first round. Not entirely so, but way more than people thought would happen. Because of this, there was a record-breaking 306 three-way runoffs, and there was even five four-way runoffs, which does not happen. Like this entire situation that we're talking about here, this has never happened before. The previous record for the number of triangulaires, this was 105, which took place back in the year 1997. In regards to a four-way runoff, the last time that there was one of those, that was all the way back in 1973. It is that rare. The situation that we're talking about here, therefore, was un uncharted territory. And so as I previously said when I was talking about strategies that the center and left wing were going to try to do in order to keep the right wing out of power, very practical decisions had to be made about stepping down and out of the race. What I mean is that with the vast majority of these triangular races, you had a race between three candidates, the right wing national rally, the left wing NFP, the new popular front, and a member of Macron's centrist coalition. In the previous election back in 2022, the national rally had massively outperformed in the polls in the second round, which allowed them to win a record-breaking 89 seats, something they hadn't been able to do before. This was such a massive threat for the left-wing parties as well as the central parties that they could not allow this to happen again. And so when the first round of results were announced, Jean-Luc, the leader of the far left, quickly would come out and say that his party was going to pull out out of any triangulaire where they were in third place. They were not going to contest it and risk things. He would vow that not a single vote was to be allowed to go to the national rally. This is quite a statement, and Macron and the center would also encourage tactical voting, but interestingly enough, they would also phrase things in a way to beg people to vote for candidates who were, quote, clearly Republican and Democratic. In other words, what he was trying to do there was call for people to tactically vote for center-left or center-right, but not for the more fringe parties. He did not want people going and voting for the left-wing socialists and France unbowed, along with their new Popular Front coalition, which, for for many in the center would be seen as just as dangerous as the right wing. That, in turn, my friends, is probably something that is going to end up coming back and biting him. The reason that I say that is because the results are out, and France is more divided than ever. The strategy of the left and center 
miraculously worked. By the deadline for withdrawing one's candidacy, over 130 left-wing candidates had stepped down for centrists, and over 80 centrist candidates had stepped down for left-wing parties. This is a massive consolidation of over 200 seats that were no longer going to be contested. And while there is no guarantee that voters of one party would willingly go to the other that the candidates preferred, this actually ended up happening. The Republican front worked remarkably well, and the national rally ended up not achieving a majority of seats as was expected. This was already extremely surprising, but even more surprising was that the national rally ended up losing to the NFP and Macron's alliance. After the final counting of the vote, the NFP would soar to first place with 182 seats. Macron's alliance would manage to hang on with 68, and the right-wing national rally would only obtain 143 seats, something that was far short of the majority that was expected. In regards to the other remaining 84 seats, 45 of these went to center-right Republicans, who actually outperformed the expected polls, and the remaining 39 went to smaller parties or independent candidates. Now, as you can imagine, this result did not exactly sit well with the national rally, whom feel that they have been cheated out of their rightful place by the political machinations of the establishment. Their would-be prime minister would describe the result as being a stitch-up, as in the entire thing was stitched together and fabricated fabricated by the government. And this, my friends, is huge. It really is. But just because the national rally did not win, it does not mean that Macron did. He may still be president, but his party actually lost many seats. Effectively, France could be facing deadlock with a hung parliament now. Because it is, my friend, that after the election, you have three major political blocs that have emerged, and none of them are close to holding a majority of at least 289 seats out of 577. Results so far have showed just over 180 seats for the new popular front leftist coalition, 160 for Macron's Together for the Republic centrist coalition, and more than 140 for the far-right National Rally Party. Without working with one of the other groups, nothing can really happen, and the National Assembly is the most important of France's two houses of parliament. It is the thing that has the final say in the lawmaking process over the Senate, which is dominated by the Conservatives. The split lower house is going to require lawmakers to build consensus across parties in order to agree on government positions and on legislative agendas. Because of how incredibly divided France's politics are, there are deep divisions over taxes, immigration, Middle Eastern policy, Russia and Ukraine, everything. And all of this makes passing any kind of legislation extremely challenging. The results mean that Macron's centrist allies almost certainly won't be able to implement their pro-business proposals such as a promise to overhaul unemployment benefits. In addition to this, it makes passing any kind of budget for the nation of France significantly more difficult. After all, no one can agree, and for those who have seen what has happened within Congress with the United States, you can probably get an idea of what I'm talking about, except on a much more severe divide. One of the questions that someone may have looking at this then is Macron able to then make a deal with the left wing? Well, Maybe. Macron might seek a deal with more moderate elements of the left, but France has no real tradition of this kind of arrangement, and so any such negotiations, if it even happens, they're expected to be very difficult and would likely result in a very informal and fragile alliance, something that would very easily fall apart at the slightest touch. In addition to that, Macron has said that he will not work with the hard left France Unbowed Party, but he might be willing to reach out to other parties in the new Popular Front in order to make things happen, such as the Socialists and the Greens. They, however, may refuse to do any kind of deal with the central government. As a result, some of Macron's allies are instead pushing him to form a government around the centrists and the conservative Republicans, who together with their allies come in fourth with around 60 seats. The problem with this grouping, though, is that it's still not enough for a majority, and they would still need the support of additional lawmakers in order to do anything. This is the thing that kind of becomes the problem when the ruling party is no longer the largest element within the government. 
But if people think that things would become easier if the left-wing parties of the new popular front took over, well, it's not. They are also not likely to be in much better of a position considering the severe infighting between the groups. The left has over the years been torn by divisions, especially after the October 7th attack by Hamas upon Israel. Jean-Luc Millicon and other leaders of the far-left France Unbowed Party have been oftentimes sharply criticized by other more moderate left-wingers for their stance on the conflict. There have been many instances in France of far-left politicians accusing Israel of pursuing genocide against Palestinians. These people have in turn then faced accusations of anti-Semitism, which is something that they do of course deny, but it is still something that has tainted political discussion. Other elements of the left may not be much better. In elections this past month for the European Parliament, the Socialists actually ran independently, separately from everyone else. But after Macron called for an early parliamentary election, this would draw leftist leaders together to form the new Popular Front. Their joint platform would promise to raise the minimum monthly salary from 1,400 to 1,600 euros, and in addition to that, pull back Macron's pension reform that had increased retirement age from 62 to 64. I already spent the first part of this video explaining that whole issue, so you who have watched understand why that is something that, while popular, may be very dangerous to actually happen. In addition, in addition to this, the left wing also wants to freeze food and energy prices, and all of this has the financial markets very worried. Still though, it doesn't mean that the left wing is actually going to be able to take charge. People may wonder what is going to happen with Jean-Luc Millicon. Well, Millicon says that the leftist alliance is ready to govern, but honestly there is no chance that he'll be named as prime minister, because Macron simply refuses to work with him. And so far, Millicon's own coalition has not proposed him, they haven't pushed him forward, or really anyone else for that matter, for the job of the new prime minister. In order to figure that out, new popular front leaders say that further internal discussions are needed. And so it is, my friends, that that in turn brings us back to Macron. Macron's own government, though it has technically speaking survived, is in tatters. The Prime Minister, Gabriel Attal, has offered his resignation, but Macron instead asked him to remain temporarily after election results left the government in limbo. Attal would in turn say that he would stay on through the upcoming Paris Olympics, or as long as was actually needed, which may be longer than anyone else thought. We don't know, as literally nothing is able to be decided. For now, Attal's government will handle the day-to-day -day aspects of management. Macron's office says that he will wait for the new National Assembly to organize itself before making any kind of further decisions on what to do about a new government. As it stands, there is no firm timeline for when Macron must actually name a new prime minister, and no firm rule that he has to pick someone from the largest party or bloc in Parliament. He doesn't have to do these things, but no one will work with him otherwise. As for what that means about Macron himself, technically speaking right now, he's safe. The president's term runs out in 2027, and he says that he will not step down. With no majority and very little possibility of implementing his own agenda, Macron comes out severely weakened from the election. But that all being said, Macron still does technically have a lot of power. Under France's constitution, he holds the power over foreign policy, European affairs, defense, and he is the guy who is in charge of negotiating and ratifying international treaties. The president is also the commander-in-chief of the country's armed forces, and he is the person who still has all of the nuclear codes. The prime minister might be strong, but they are accountable to parliament. They lead the government and they introduce bills. The new prime minister might be unwilling or unable to seriously challenge Macron's defense and foreign policy powers, even if they go and pass a series of legislation, which again, is unlikely to happen at all. So it is then, my friends, that with Macron pushing for further French and from that European involvement in the war in Ukraine against Russia, who really knows where the future will lead? Right now, nothing is certain, and France is completely up in the air. My friends, this has been Sakui with the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. Thank you all very much for watching. I am sorry this took a while to get out. This actually, technically speaking, should have been two videos, with the first part being what it was explaining how it is that we got to where we are, and the second thing being an update. But now, with the time that I'm releasing this, all of this is combined into one. So I really do hope that after the time, energy, and effort, and everything put into this, that you like the video and do whatever you can to help this in the algorithm. I appreciate you all for watching. Please let me know 
in the comment section below if there's anything that we should be doing next. I have a series of videos that we are working on, one of which is Sudan, as I know many of you had requested, but also we are going to be doing an update on specifically the craziness that is happening in Britain and how it is that we got to the UK's elections. With that, we're going to go ahead and let things go here today. My friends, thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time, and goodbye, guys.